Knobox Dance presents Dance Behind the Screen. Process production and social media. Hey members, welcome to our podcast. We are Knobox Dance, a social media based company. We strive to say no to the box. We connect interdisciplinary art, technology, and artists to re envision the process of art making and sharing. Welcome back to Dance Behind the Screen podcast. This is your co-host, Marthea. On this episode, I talk with Kathleen McGuire Gaines, the founder of Minding the Gap. Kathleen is a former dancer, a writer, and a fundraiser. For the past 10 years, Kathleen has written more than 100 articles on dance for Dance Magazine Point, Dance Spirit, and Dance Teacher Magazines. Minding the Gap was founded as a reaction to the outpouring of support she received when she shared her article, Why Are We Still So Bad at Addressing Dancers' Mental Health, on the Dance Magazine website in the summer of 2017. In this episode, we talk a little bit more about that article and the importance and value of mental health and advocating for your own mental health. This is a very important episode. I hope you enjoy our conversations and you can apply some of these resources to yourself. Enjoy. So yeah, we already talked a little bit of just about how you're hanging in there with COVID-19 and just this worldwide pandemic. How are you seeing the dance world is reacting to everything right now? I mean, shows are getting canceled. Everyone's just kind of paused. But on your end, what are what are you seeing? Uh, you know, I mean, this is a really difficult time for for everyone in the world, obviously. Um, But I do think it is an especially difficult time for dancers um, because, well, first of all, obviously dancing is a a physical pursuit that requires proper equipment and space and um, all of those things. So there's that physical element to it, but I think the mental side of it is inextricable from that physical portion of it. And, I think uh, also that dancers are actually, you know, we have, at least in popular culture, there's this idea of these kind of like vicious ballerinas, right? Like, (laughs) right. Like it's so competitive. And I get asked all the time by people who are not in the dance world, um, you know, how you could have friends, you know, when you're so competitive with each other. Hmm. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that, that dance is actually also a very social, um, Thing to do and mm-hmm. it's a very community centered um, experience and so I think the loss of of that human connection is mm-hmm. even even harder for dancers in some ways um, because they are so isolated from the community that that kind of holds them together and, and helps give them a sense of identity and support and all of that so I mean I think dancers are definitely struggling um, I see, um, you know, one thing that, that definitely concerns me that I'm seeing is, you know, there's a, you know, 50 free dance classes streaming on Instagram at any mm-hmm. given second, right? And mm-hmm. I actually am concerned that there are many dancers because of kind of fear of falling behind or losing your physical fitness or whatever that may actually be trying to dance even more than they were Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in what circumstances, right. Um, You know, it's, it's very frustrating to try and dance in your living room or your kitchen um, without a bar or kicking a cabinet or whatever. Um, So, you know, I worry about that a little bit about um, becoming maybe a little bit too obsessed with that. Um, I also think that there are a lot of dancers who have stories that will be very much unfinished and may not get the closure that they need um, because Mm -hmm. of these circumstances. Um, I think you wrote about that in one of your more recent articles, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I did. I did a piece for Dance Spirit that they put on their website that's about uh, dealing with lost performance. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know that's that's hard no matter what the performance is right because that's kind of the the crowning moment of all of this effort that you've put in exactly yeah and I think I think even more so if that performance was meant to provide you some kind of real like larger closure whether that was you know 
graduating from your program or, or your school or even ending your career. You know, there are dancers mm -hmm. who, who are not going to say goodbye to the audience because that opportunity is gone. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm seeing that a lot too. So those are kind of on the more negative side. Mm -hmm. on, the more, on the more positive side, um, I think the dancers that are able to do this uh, are actually also doing a, a good job of taking this time to think about what else makes them happy, right? Mm -hmm. Like what, what other, other things that maybe they don't normally have time to invest in are they making time for now? Um, and that really is important, you know, um, mental health professionals um, who work with dancers say all the time that one of the really big barriers for dancers to like true mental wellness is this kind of identity that is completely wrapped in dance, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't allow for anything else. And um, I actually think that exploring those other things right now is one of the most productive things that a dancer could do. And, and I think there are many that are. I think it just proves just to the value of what you started with. We are minding the gap and just the relevance and how important it is, especially now when we're being forced to kind of look at these issues of mental health, whether you want to or not. It's kind of, there's no option right now, mm -hmm. especially those who have, we're stuck at home. We have more discretionary time. Even if you are trying to fill it with classes and things like that, I think there's just more time for thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk a little bit more. I think we can come back to some of these ideas, but I just want to talk more about how you define mental health. And uh, from the beginning, I, I was doing my research in, so you started creating Minding the Gap in based off an article you wrote in 2017. Mm -hmm. And if it's okay with you, um, I pulled a quote and I just wanted to read it to the audience. Is that okay with you? Of course, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, you wrote, I remember sobbing to my mother on the phone. I love dance, but it doesn't love me. On the worst days, I considered that I would be less of a burden to the people that I loved if I were gone. It would be better than not dancing. So me personally, I often describe my own relationship with dance as this kind of love-hate relationship. And I think that that is really common um, for a lot of people. And we and I more recently did an interview based on dance nutrition and these ideas of perfectionism. And I think that that's really prevalent in our culture. Um, so I was hoping you could kind of talk about how you went from writing that article, the place you were in there to where you are now and, and how your definition of mental health has really shifted. If you uh, you know, tear your ACL, you're not going to not go to the doctor because that would make you look weak. Right. <laughs> like it just doesn't make sense. Your ACL is torn and you need it to dance, but mentally we don't give ourselves the same grace. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that there is a leave it at the door mentality in dance culture. There mm -hmm. is this notion of, you know, some people are, are mentally strong enough for this and some people aren't. And, you know, I just kind of call bullshit on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like I, I just, you know, it's not, um, that's not, that's not, you know, your mental, having a mental health challenge has nothing to do with your strength. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that we can kind of bully ourselves into thinking that, you know, we should be stronger. We should, those other dancers are able to deal with, with, you know, the challenges better than me, therefore I'm not strong enough. Mm -hmm. um, and really, I just think that we need to address that mental health in the same way that we're addressing our physical health. And that means being proactive. And that means seeking out our quote weaknesses and looking for ways to buttress them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so mining the gap, you know, after I wrote that article, um, that article went went very viral, and mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it was really totally stunning for me to watch that happen. Um, because of course, you you lay yourself bare like that, and you put yeah, it out so the vulnerable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it and shows how much you know the dance community needed to hear that too. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. 
it's one of those things where it's like, it's very validating to have others speak up and say like, you're, you're speaking to me and I, and mm -hmm. I understand. Um, but it's also a really terrifying situation to have so much company. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think one, um, you know, I'd been writing about mental health for a long time. I've been writing for the dance magazines for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been writing on mental health issues for that entire time. Um, but I kind of wasn't receiving that kind of feedback, you know? Um, so to receive that feedback on such a big scale in such a big way and with mm -hmm. such urgency um, and to literally have dancers and mental health professionals reaching out to me to say, um, you know, we're with you, like, yes, like, what do we do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was kind of like, well, um, well, okay, I guess I'm, you know, I'm the one here with the microphone and um, people want to do something. So let's do something. Mm -hmm. um, so at the very end of 2018, um, I quit my full time job as a professional fundraiser. And I, I started I founded Mind in the Gap and I've been fully dedicated to it ever since. You are listening to Knobloch's Dance. What are some like tactical strategies that you would suggest for people who are looking for free resources? Because maybe right now we can't all afford to go to therapy or um, reach out to a professional. So if you do want to make those steps or you want to maybe share some resources with a friend or something like that, um, where do you think we should start? Because there's sure. so many things online. <laughs> Yeah, no, and it can be overwhelming even for even for me. <laughs> right, and you then know. it's like, oh, and then you go into a tailspin because it's like, now what? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, so first I want to say that um, definitely that you don't need to be in psychological distress to go to therapy, right? So that's, I think that's really important mm -hmm. for everyone to understand. Like, you you deserve you deserve support if you need it, period. And that doesn't Can you say that again? I think that's so powerful. <laughs> <laughs> you, you deserve support if you need it. That's mm -hmm. it. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't have to be, is this a critical enough situation? It really, really doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the same way you would go to a massage therapist if your back was hurting before you went to go get back surgery, you know, mm -hmm. like let's avoid back surgery. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that's really important for everyone to understand. Um, uh, when I speak publicly, often dancers will be like, how, how do I know I should go to therapy? And I'm like, you, you just ask that question and that's how, you know, <laughs> like, that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that's one. The, the next really is that, well, under these current circumstances there, if you are someone who has health insurance at mm -hmm. least in the United States, the majority of the health insurance companies are waiving co-pays for behavioral health. So that is definitely mm -hmm. something to look into. Um, often if you just even go to your health, health insurer's website or whatever, they'll have notices up about it. Um, and so that's, that's great. That's um, wonderful. Yeah, so that's definitely something to remember. The next is, that even if you don't have any kind of insurance, it is always worth it to reach out to a mental health provider to see if they'll work with you on a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. um, many, many, many of them will. You know, they, they have taken an oath to, to help people um, mm -hmm. and they do have uh, a, a certain kind of mandate to, to serve the community, right? Um, so, so what would you recommend they say? So I think, I think I would reach out whether it was on the phone or in an email and just say like, here, here's my circumstance. Um, I, I, I believe that I would benefit from, from support and I really need support right now. I do not have health insurance and you know, I'm currently unemployed or my employment, I'm on, on unemployment or whatever. Um, is there any possibility of working with someone in your office on a sliding scale? Okay. Um, you know, what the response to that will be will vary a little bit, um, but it's worth asking the question. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, uh, a mental health practice will have um, 
kind of like interns or like, you know, people who are almost have their PhD, who Mm -hmm. have to do a certain number of hours in order to become accredited. Right. And very often those people like will be, could even be free or like very, very low cost. Okay. So that's, that's something to think about too. And then without going into all the very complicated, um, you know, especially in the United States, because this is all very state by state. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are states like, for example, the state of New York has an entire database of therapists that are donating their time right now. Um, You know, uh, I know that, uh, okay, okay, let's, uh, let's unpack this, which is Mm -hmm. an initiative by a dancer from Gibney. Uh, She has compiled some resources. Um, I think they're all in in New York, but um, for free mental health support. So it, it is out there right now more than ever. So, so that's a positive right? <laughs> for the situation, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. More accessible. Yes. People are seeing the value and uh, importance of mental health. Yes. Paying attention to it. So I want to talk a little bit about social media in relationship to mental health. Mm-hmm. And I guess you can decide kind of how, what lens you want to address this from, whether it's like your own personal experience, what you see with Minding the Gap. Um, uh, as a writer, but how do you see social media impacting the mental health of dancers? Yeah, and um, I, I actually did write an article on this. I think it was a few years ago, and I'm trying to remember if it was Point or Dance Magazine. But um, I think it, I think social media for dancers is absolutely a double edged sword. Mm-hmm. I mean, so on the one hand. You know, when I was dancing, I couldn't just pull up a video of any dancer in the world <laughs> at, at, at my fingertips. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know, I stopped dancing right as that, like right as YouTube was becoming a thing and people were, you know, we were still videotaping with a camera, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> not to age myself, but that's <laughs> true. Um, and so, it, you know, on the one hand, it's a really beautiful and inspiring thing to be like, you know, mm-hmm. here we go. I'm watching Sarah Lane. It's the do, access. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's wonderful. And then on, you know, and then with social, with the social media part of that, you know, some of these dancers are willing to be more vulnerable on social media and are willing to share when things are hard. And that's incredibly impactful. Um, I think what, what dancers need to do when they're looking through their feed Mm -hmm. is ask themselves, like, is this making me feel good or bad? Mm -hmm. And ask yourself that about the time you're spending there, but also about the accounts you're following. Mm -hmm. Like if there's an account that makes you feel bad about yourself, I don't care how pretty that dancer is. I really don't. Unfollow now, Mm -hmm. immediately. (laughs) Yeah, I always tell my students or if I go give guest lectures and things like that, like you get to curate. We have the privilege to curate the media that we intake. So how can we actually curate it? Don't just follow all these people because you don't realize, but it can be impacting you. Do you have certain accounts that you would recommend like you like to follow or that you think um, might provide nice um, media intake for our listeners? Sure. I mean, I think so in the kind of like mental health wellness kind of advocacy area. Um, mm-hmm. I mentioned, okay, let's, uh, let's unpack this. Mm-hmm. Um, Leal, who's the dancer from Give Me Doing That, does a great job. And um, so that's, that's a good one. Uh, I have a friend who has an account called Whistle While You Work that is focused on um, trying to eliminate abuse in dance. Um, mm-hmm. and, and they share really interesting things about kind of like how to voice consent in the studio, like Mm -hmm. how to practice saying no, you know, things like that, Mm -hmm. um, that those things can be incredibly useful. Um, in terms of dancers, uh, I mean, I think, uh, James Whiteside and Isabella Boyston are absolutely incredible. Um, they're beautiful dancers, but they're also silly you know, and, and they don't take themselves too seriously and they're very positive. Um, so I like following them. Obviously, um, Biscuit Ballerina is incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, Shelby Williams, the dancer behind that, 
you know, I, I admire a great deal for what she's doing because I think we look at, we look at her Instagram, which for anyone that hasn't seen it is, you know, dancers falling and making mistakes. And she kind of has this like alter ego that dances really badly. Mm -hmm. And it's very funny, but also to remember that the reason she created that and the reason she's doing it is to force us all to kind of like laugh at perfectionism a little bit Mm -hmm. and realize that we are all fallible. We all fall. We all have a bad day. We all wish our feet were less sickled and higher and all of those things. I'm curious, um, first, how can those that are listening start to advocate for the importance of mental health? whether it's in their community, with their families, what advice do you have in that? I mean, honestly, I think step one is, is kind of in yourself. And I think mm-hmm. this, the first, the first step in that is, is self-compassion. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's a, a wonderful therapist that I just interviewed a few days ago who said, like, let's think about self-compassion as, um, the way you would treat your dearest friend, right? Mm-hmm. Like, why like when you have this like narrative in your head that's going and going and going when you're putting yourself down when you're being so hard on yourself like just like stop for a second like try and recognize that you're doing that stop it Mm -hmm. and then say like would I say this to Susie like if my if my friend was feeling the way I'm feeling am I saying to myself what what I would say to her because you absolutely deserve that love right um Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of step one. Um, I think too, if you, if it feels safe for you, if it feels okay for you to, to share, right. To, to say out loud, like, you know, I'm having a really tough day mentally today. Like Mm. it, it, you don't know who hears that. Right. And you don't know how it impacts them. And I recognize actually that, you know, the ability to speak about your mental health challenges. Um, One therapist once told me that like, you know, that's evidence of, of, of real healing, right? Your ability to, you're, you're, you're out of the woods, right? Like you can, you can talk openly about it. Um, So that's not something everyone can do and that's okay. But for those of us who can, especially if you're in a leadership position, especially if you're a teacher, Mm -hmm. especially if you're a parent, you know, like to, to just, to give it air and just say it, it doesn't have to be this like depressing lecture, you know, like it can just be a statement, you know, like I'm feeling down today. Like this is mentally tough today. Um, so I think those are, those are very easy little tangible things people can do. I think in your studio, if you feel like you can, you know, asking for resources, like, parents even more even more impactful Mm -hmm. is for parents to ask for resources right Mm -hmm. they're the one paying the bill Mm -hmm. (laughs) if Mm -hmm. enough people are asking they'll listen Mm -hmm. um so i think those are kind of the most immediately tangible things that Mm -hmm. that kind of dancers and parents can do on the other side like on the institutional side and kind of yeah what about dealing with universities or people like nobox we have this digital platform what do you think are things that we can do to continue to advocate for, for mental health part of we're trying to have, or we are having these topics of the month. And, and for May it's wellness because we see such a just confusion really in the dance world about what wellness is. And for all of us talking on the team, we were like mental health is something really important. And we have, we see your resources and what you're working on and your story Um, But what are other ways that people who have these digital platforms can advocate for mental health? Absolutely. I mean, I think, well, first, you know, sharing things that you see that, that make you feel good or better, you know, like if, if you see something where someone is being vulnerable or where um, they're providing a resource or they're, you know, you know, bringing up a mental health issue, you know, share that. And, Mm -hmm. and, and say, you know, I'm sharing this because I relate, maybe you can too, you know, mm-hmm. um, that it's a really, that, I mean, that's one of the beauties of social media, right? Like you, mm-hmm. you just don't know when you share something like that, who's going to see it and what kind of impact it's going to have on them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, 
that's kind of the easiest way. I think at, on a larger scale in, in kind of dance leadership, at the very least, if a dance school or institution, you know, is teaching dancers, you know, like there should be at the very least, like the phone number of someone who is a mental health practitioner available to the dancers. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not saying everybody's got to have like a, a staff psychologist. Mm -hmm. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's so, you know, maybe someday. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, you know, to, to prioritize a little bit, to take the time to reach out in your community, to talk to some mental health practitioners and find someone that either gets it right or mm -hmm. could get it or is willing to come spend some time in the studio watching classes and like acclimating themselves. Um, you know, the lowest hanging fruit there is usually a sports psychologist because they're mm -hmm. used to working with athletes, but mm -hmm. I definitely wouldn't limit it to that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and have that phone number, have that contact that costs you nothing except time, right? Mm -hmm. And then post the phone number on the bulletin board next to the schedule. Like that is very, very, very destigmatizing. Like that's such great advice. And that's something people can actually go and do. Well, when yeah. we're allowed back in. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but you know, right now, if you're sending an email to your dancers, mm -hmm. you put it at the bottom of every email. Like mm -hmm. here's here's a person that we know, mm -hmm. you know. That's um, great. And even in the universities, they can link to what the university provides too. That could be a really great. Strategy. Never, yeah, never assume that just because you put it in the handbook, they've ever looked at it again, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I find very often that there are places where they have done this work to create this relationship, but then it just exists in this bubble and the dancers don't even know it's there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you tell us more about what you hope to gain from your platform, Minding the Gap, and this longitudinal study that you're doing with more than 200 dancers. So like, tell us more about what's the data that you're looking to collect and then what do you want to do with all of that data? Absolutely. So my interest in data really comes from the kind of advocacy work that I've almost accidentally been doing for a very long time through my writing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is, you know, when I get an artistic director on the phone or a ballet master or a teacher on the phone or even a dancer, um, you know, especially when I'm talking to dance leadership, I always ask whether it's germane to the conversation or not. Um, you know, do you have a mental health pro um, professional available to your dancers? Mm. I, you know, I ask it all the time because I'm just one, I'm curious because I want to collect every mental health professional who knows anything about dancers mm -hmm. <laughs> because I love them <laughs> and I'm a nerd and I love talking to them and, mm -hmm. and I want to know who they are so that I can tell the dancers who they are. Um, but then also I'm just kind of curious and I feel like me just asking that question could maybe plant a little seed. Mm -hmm. um, and occasionally, you know, I've had conversations with dance leadership that have been very challenging in that they don't necessarily want to believe me like when I say that this is a really big issue, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily want to believe it's their responsibility. Um, so what I find in my advocacy is that I, I'm longing for data that doesn't necessarily exist. Um, mm -hmm. There is some amazing research being done on dancers, you know, International Association of Dance Medicine and Science and the Performing mm -hmm. Arts Medical Association. And, you know, there are amazing people out there doing work who have like dedicated their lives to, to trying to address the wellness of dancers. But I find that these really fundamentally kind of, to me, simple things that I want to be able to say, I can't say with data. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I what, want, what are those things that you want to be able to say? Yeah, like, I mean, I want to be able to look at, at a director and say, well, you know, here's the study that shows that the depression rate in, in dancers is X, mm -hmm. right? Like, here's the anxiety rate, you know, like these really basic things. Mm -hmm. um, or like, here's something looking at self-esteem and like how much lower their self-esteem is than the general population. Mm -hmm. You know, these are things that I all believe in my bones to like be true. Mm -hmm. But without and you data, found it through all these interviews that you've had too, and with all the writing you've done. Right. But so just not that quantitative data. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And so I've done a few surveys um, after that 2017 article we were talking about earlier. <clears throat> excuse me. I, um, I did a sur- dance magazine. Let me post a survey on their website. Um, and that is available on my, on my website, which is we are minding the gap.org. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I asked really simple questions. It's like, have you experienced a mental health challenge in the last five years? Um, and of course I don't have it in front of me, but I believe 75% of the answers said yes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, really simple things like that. Mm-hmm. Is that how you created the graphics that are on the website next to the study? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I've done other, other surveys looking at what mental health issues are the most important to dancers. Um, and you know, you might assume that eating disorders would be number one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because we do know that dancers are three times more likely to have an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, but in fact, when I surveyed dancers on the mental health pr- issues that they're most concerned about, number one was self-esteem and self-confidence, mm-hmm. um, which only shows that to me that dancers are very smart and intuitive. Like, yes, eating disorder rates are high, but they intuitively understand that the root of that is in their self-image. Mm-hmm. It's in their self-confidence. And how they see themselves. Yeah. So let's be proactive. Let's, let's figure out how to address that. And then the eating disorder rates will follow. Um, so the study, um, you're asking about, well, one, so I've been after this grant for two years to, to fund it. And, um, literally the week, the stay at home, the stay at home order was put in place. I got a call from the foundation essentially saying like, this would be a your funded call, but because we need to fund emergency work, um, it's it's oh. postponed indefinitely. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry. Yeah. What, thank you. Um, I mean, the foundation is doing the right thing, right? This is right. this is a mental health crisis, right? And I can't That's study on dancers. a much larger scale. Yeah. Yes, and I can't study dancers that aren't aren't in the studio. Like that's, I mean. I guess I, I can, but not in the but way But not that the kind of data that you're <laughs> hoping to get, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, I, I believe in my bones it will happen. It's just a matter of when. Um, but basically the idea is that um, I work, I'm working with three um, psychologists on this work. And we would take um, a group of dancers. Uh, right now it's 150 dancers, but there's po- potential participation where it could double or close to double. Um, we would take a body of dancers, we would begin with basic measurements on things like depression and anxiety, you know, the things that I want to measure. Mm -hmm. Um, and then over the course of three years, we would implement a robust mental health program that rivals Mm -hmm. the physical health program in that institution. Mm -hmm. And along the way, we would continue to measure both qualitatively and quantitatively, um, to try well, one, to, to show one, that there's a need and two, that there's a clear way to address that need. And then also to kind of ground truth our assumptions of what would actually help dancers, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, we have a plan for a way that we think would be effective to implement a program like this because you can't just plop a psychologist in a dance studio and expect dancers to go talk to them. Right. You know, mm-hmm. it's like massive cult- cultural <laughs> shift that has to happen. Right. Um, and it actually starts with the teachers and the, first yeah, the support years. of the, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The first year is very focused on the teachers and like helping them identify mental health issues and understand and create protocols for like what you do and safety nets and all of that. Don't forget to say no to the box. What advice or resources do you have for our listeners to navigate this hashtag new normal um, Mm -hmm. that we're in? Because you've mentioned, you know, looking up healthcare professionals, calling insurance, things like that, which I think is really valuable. But if we're looking for maybe an article to read or just some uh, inspirational content, I guess, Mm -hmm. too, like what, where would we go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, so yeah, I, I started, um, they're call, I'm calling them the Dancer Mental Health Town Hall Meetings, um, and you saw the first one, mm-hmm. um, and I actually have another one that I'm recording after our, our interview, um, and mm-hmm. this one is on, um, on you know, when COVID-19 means that it's over without 
closure. So, you know, mm -hmm. addressing that kind of unfinished business that a lot of dancers are feeling. Um, my commitment is to do those uh, every two weeks for as long as I can. Um, mm -hmm. And there's kind of endless possibilities to the nuance of each of those discussions. But mm -hmm. each one features a mental health professional and a dancer. I think it's really important mm -hmm. for the dancer's voice to be included in that. Um, and I, I also, to your point, like it is very powerful to hear another dancer speak openly. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to provide a platform for that. Um, those people can attend live if they register or they can watch the, the video after. Um, the what was the response for the first video? Did you have any feedback from viewers or I'm just curious? Yeah, um, the response has been good, definitely. And I, I do plan to, to send out some surveys after I've got a couple of these under my belt to the people who have participated to see how we can refine it or make it better, or better serve what they want um, or need. Um, but yeah, no, the response has been really positive. Um, I, what I am hearing is that people appreciate how kind of accessible it is in terms of mm -hmm. like, it doesn't feel like a bunch of talking heads with PhDs, like mm -hmm. telling you how to feel, right? It's and digestible it's, information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, and part of that is like having the dancer, well, part of that is is that I myself am not a PhD, right? So like if they if they go off on jargon mm -hmm. talk, I can kind of be like, okay, come back down to earth now. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how you're moderating then, the conversation. Yeah, and then also to have the dancer there because literally in real time, we can take a psychological concept and apply it to a real person's life, like right mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very helpful. Um, so the feedback has been great. And mm -hmm. I'm very excited about um, the one I'm doing today. Uh, it'll be uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet soloist Margaret Mullen, mm -hmm. who is uh, leaving P&B after 12 years with the company um, and has, you know, not having a farewell. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Dr. Elise Gavarla, who is another one of my kind of uh, advisors for Minding the Gap. Um, and then there, there are very exciting ones coming in the future, but I can't quite, can't quite announce them yet. So. <laughs> we'll, we'll link the, you know, everything in the show notes so our listeners can definitely watch your town halls. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The other, and the other thing I would recommend with regards to mental health is um, the International Association of Dance, Medicine, and Science has, if you go to their YouTube channel, they have started a, uh, a mental health like task force um, and they're mm -hmm. doing weekly webinars. And, oh, great. Um, you know, the psychologists that they have talking in those webinars are, you know, I, I like fangirl over them. <laughs> they're really <laughs> excellent. So <laughs> um, it's worth checking that out too. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, so I have one more question before we shift into our final round. Um, so if you had to, could you share three lifestyle tips for our listeners to help better their mental health? Yeah, so I think the first one is, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about already, which is to speak to yourself the way you would speak to someone you love um, and to really like hold yourself accountable to that. Um, the next would be uh, goal setting. I think that um, this was this is like a this was like an epiphany moment for me when I was interviewing. Actually, it was Dr. Brian Goodin who was on that first town hall, probably eight years ago. Um, and I was interviewing him, and we were talking about setting goals. And I literally got off. I hung up the phone, and I was just like, "Why didn't anybody tell me that?" <laughs> um, but you know, dancers tend to be pretty poor goal setters, right? Like we we conflate our dreams and aspirations with our goals. Hmm. Um, your goal should not be to be a principal dancer in a specific company. Your goal should not be to be a principal dancer in any company, <laughs> like, hmm. because you have no control over hmm. whether or not that happens. Like there, there are so many ingredients in that. Like, it's not just about how good you are. It's not just about like, there are so many things, right? There's hmm. luck, there's timing there's height, there's, I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many things that you can't control. Mm. So in, instead, make sure you anchor your goal to something you can control, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you need to be a little careful with that because, you know, that has eating disorder written all over it. But in terms of performance, right? So mm -hmm. I can, my goal can be to practice, you know, to, to nail my 
double pirouette on the left and practice. And I'm going to achieve that goal by practicing it every day, even though it scares me and Mm -hmm. doing some Pilates to strengthen my core so that I'm more likely to, to hit it. Right. So, you know, that I think is, is a really important one. Um, Mm -hmm. the last I think, um, is identity, right? So the way that dancers Mm -hmm. are, like, if you ask someone, ask a dancer, who are you? They're going to say, I'm a dancer, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, this is actually something Brian talked about in, um, in that first town hall. Um, he was like, okay, great. You're a dancer. Like now get out a piece of paper and write down the other 11 things that you Mm -hmm. are. Right. And then put that up on your wall and occasionally look at it. And ask yourself, am I honoring all of these pieces of myself or am I only honoring this piece of myself? Mm -hmm. Um, Because the end of dance is going to come for everyone Mm -hmm. at some point, right? And you, you, you deserve, and you, you deserve to, to, to kind of have an idea of what's next, right? And Mm -hmm. you deserve to have things that make you happy. I mean, we start dancing because it's joyful. You know, I have a four-year-old daughter that I watch dance around the kitchen. Like that's why you start dancing because there's <laughs> music on and it makes your body feel good and you do it. Mm-hmm. But then at some point when it tips over to a certain amount of seriousness, it's no longer an outlet, right? It's a, it's hmm. a job. It's a, it's not, you need a new outlet. Like, and dancers don't replace it. They don't replace that, that early joy outlet kind of that they had before it was encumbered by expectations and auditions and all of that you have to replace that we have what's called our flash four round where we ask all our guests to answer four questions in a flash are you ready Uh, i think so (laughs) okay here we go flash four Question number one, if you had to recommend a resource to our audience, what would it be? And I'm gonna add the note, other than your own resources. Absolutely. Um, I think the International Association of Dance Medicine and Science. Question number two, what was the first dance you saw? Mm. Uh, I grew up in Binghamton, New York, which is in, well, upstate. us New Yorkers say upstate New York. It's not that far upstate. So if there are any, <laughs> any real upstate New Yorkers out there, <laughs> like, um, but I grew up in Binghamton, New York, and I remember um, New York City Ballet came and did Swan Lake, and I was very young, and uh, I, it just, it's my first memory of watching dance, and I was completely transfixed, and it was done. I was a, I was a goner. <laughs> <laughs> you loved it ever since. Question yep. number three, do you think social media has a positive influence on the dance world, yes or no? So definitely both. What is your favorite social media platform? That is, that is a hard one. Um, uh, um, I think I met, I mean, I mentioned the Cindy's earlier, James and Isabella. Like I, I really, I really appreciate what they bring to the world. Um, I also really love the Black Swan Diaries, um, which is uh, a woman who honestly has been talking, been talking openly about depression on her blog as a dancer for a long time. And um, she's kind of a, one of the mental health warriors paving the way. So I'll throw those two out. Mm, great, thank you. Okay, I know I said last question, but I just <laughs> am dying to know, how do you, and is it okay if I ask you one more question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm just wondering, for me, like mental health can kind of just have such like a heavy feeling. So how do you, writing about it, talking about it, producing content about it, how do you balance that heaviness when it is kind of like, it seems to be like a lot of your job? Um, How do you balance that? Uh, That's a great question. And I'll be honest, I don't always do it super well. (laughs) Um, I, you know, I, I, I am in therapy frequently. Like, you know, I, I still, I use therapy as, as my, as part of my, self-care right like Mm -hmm. it's not it's not crisis level all the time it can be stress management and that's fine Mm -hmm. um you know I mean just the other day I finished an article I think it was two days ago and uh my husband walked into the room and I was just like you know what's really exhausted during a uh global health pandemic like writing about a global health pandemic all the time (laughs) 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 that is really tiring um so, I mean, I, I can't claim to balance it well all the time, um, but I think what keeps me going really is 
having conversations uh, with people and, and realizing that, that it's helping them. I mean, that really is incredibly motivating to, to feel like you've put something out into the world and it helps someone. Um, and it's really why I do everything I do. So. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I was just dying to know, and I'm sure our <laughs> listeners were too, because you provided so much helpful information. I will, I will say uh, on that note that like with the research, um, you know, like my co-pays for therapy are part of the budget for that research hmm. because it's a great strategy. I have to take care of myself. Um, mm-hmm. And actually in like larger institutions, universities and things, um, I have a friend who's a a therapist working with athletes at a major university, she is required per her contract to go to therapy every two weeks because compassion fatigue is a really serious thing. Um, Mm -hmm. and it has to be addressed. So that's helpful. Yeah. I could just keep talking to you. (laughs) I feel like you just have so much information and mental health is something that I'm very passionate about as well. And so it's exciting to get to talk to somebody who's an expert in nav- navigating that field and hear how you're connecting that to the dance world. So again, thank you um, for, for the work that you're doing and leading this way and, and for having the conversation and being so open with me and, and with our listeners. So thank you. Oh my goodness. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for taking your time to tune into Dance Behind the Screen, a bi-monthly interview series where we go behind the screen to question process, product, and social media. Be sure to follow us on social media, at KNOW Box Dance. See you next time and don't forget to say no to the box.